Today, uh, I wanted to talk about loving kindness, because without a talk on loving kindness, a retreat is not a retreat, in my perception, anyway. And originally, uh, the plan was to talk about compassion, but for a meditation retreat, I think, especially when the joy is starting to arise, it can be helpful to practice with metta more than compassion because metta is a little bit more of a kind of uh, easy, childlike, light-hearted kind of emotion that actually naturally morphs into compassion when faced with suffering. And most of the time now, we might not be working with quite as much suffering. So the attitude of metta and the cultivation of metta is a beautiful um, uh, practice both to, again, align yourself with the right intentions of kindness and compassion and the sense of non-controlling, non-ownership, letting things be, letting things go, giving to the moment, giving of yourself to the practice, giving your time and energy to whatever's in front of you. These are all beautiful, right intentions that we can have towards the uh, meditation object that's in front of us. But at the same time, there's another practice of metta that can be used as another means into deep meditation. And the practice of loving kindness and compassion are known as uh, Brahma Viharas. They take us to these beautiful um, states uh, akin to the Brahma Loka, which is like uh, the same uh, state of mind that you get into with jhanas through Anapanasati. It's exactly the same. And they are known as divine abidings. So they're places that we can really uh, rest the mind. And the more we cultivate these practices, the more we can actually make them our dwelling place. So they become beautiful, unconditional abidings that are um, accessed through cultivating a very pure and loving heart, a heart of unconditional love. And this is the difference between the love that we talk about in the world which is often um, related to attachment, to craving, to clinging, to possession, rather than giving things freedom to be. Um, uh, Whereas metta is an unconditional love that just cares about another person's well-being, another person's flourishing, and um, turns into compassion when that same love meets suffering. So compassion is love's response to suffering. In the Karaniya Metta Sutta, The Buddha says that metta, loving kindness, is like the love that a mother has towards her only child. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should we cherish all living beings. And this is the second part of that sentence, which is more important than the first, in a sense, because it's a mother's love to the child spread to all living beings. This is the difference. If a mother's love to her child or a father's love to his child was enough, then none of us would need, well, many of us would not need to be on this meditation retreat. And instead of becoming monks and nuns, we'd all become parents to get enlightened that way. But of course, the difficulty there is that we consider our children are ours. And then there's attachment, there's clinging, there's worry. I taught a retreat in America recently, purely on loving kindness. It was a seven-day retreat. And it was a real emotional journey for many, many people, noticing what the obstacles to that unconditional love really are. And one person said that when they practiced it towards their child, they just had feelings of tremendous guilt and worry and concern uh, because they somehow were terrified of becoming a bad mother. And this was blocking the love. It was blocking their availability to be there unconditionally for their child and say, no matter how you turn out, I love you just the same. This is a very nice phrase with loving kindness, no matter what. And Ajahn Brahm has this famous story from his father who said to him when he was about 14 years old, um, whatever you do in your life, the door of my heart is open to you. He actually said the door of my home or house, but it meant the same thing. And these are kind of guys in, you know, in Britain in like the 60s or 70s. So they don't have like this kind of very kind and tender way to express it. So they say, the door of my house, son, you know, is open, no matter what. But he meant the door of my heart. And it's the no matter what that's the unconditional part there. 
So metta and karuna and compassion are committed to one's welfare. I think commitment is a really important part of this. Other aspects of love include forgiveness, being able to forgive our faults, the faults in others, the faults in the world, in life, the faults in our breath, the faults in our meditation, the perceived faults, whatever you think they are. And often it's also uh, strengthened through feelings of gratitude. You know, if you think about people in your life you're grateful towards, or even the people here that you're grateful to your companions, it generates automatically this feeling of goodwill. And also it involves commitment, it involves patience, uh, a consistency. And something Ajahn Brahm once said to me, I kept it, I printed it off, because it was the most beautiful expression to me of unconditional love. He said, I'm always around for you, always keeping my mind on the lookout to make sure you're safe and prospering. And another thing he once said was, I'm committed to being kind to you. This is a no matter what. It's not I'm committed to being kind as long as you please me, or as long as I get something in return. It's a love that's unconditional, expecting nothing in return, not even expecting his disciples to progress on the path. The fact that we're trying is enough. You know, the outcome is immaterial. So this is such a freeing and beautiful kind of love that you really feel you can relax around, you can be yourself, you can show up authentically in life. And so much of the time, you know, we're afraid to do that because we judge ourselves. We don't have that unconditional acceptance for who we think we are, you know, for our idiosyncrasies, our habits, which are all conditioned anyway, the mistakes we've made, etc. And so because of that, we're looking for love from outside. We haven't learned to accept ourselves. And love can be so, so healing in this way. So love, or loving kindness and compassion, are two aspects of the same emotion that just, um, in a way, uh, transforms itself in response to the situation. So love has this inherent wisdom. You can also say that uh, mudita, or sympathetic joy, is love when it meets happiness, or people doing well, people... Um, prospering in life, then that love turns into a kind of celebratory joy that rejoices with the person. And even equanimity is one of these Brahma Viharas. It's not a blank and dull state of mind. It's an incredibly beautiful, cool and soft state of mind that's founded on these other Brahma Viharas. And it's the kind of love that can stand back knowing it's done what it can and accept that life and beings and meditation too is going to unfold according to conditions, according to its own karma, if you like. So it has that ability to have a perspective on things. So loving kindness and compassion are centrally important to this path of meditation. They come straight away in the second factor of the noble path. Again, the second factor stems from right view. So in a sense, we can say this Noble Eightfold Path is sequential. The deeper our insight into suffering and the cause, craving, not love, but craving, <laughs> attached love, if you like, or just uh, grasping after things. Um, you know, another aspect of right view is this idea of non-self, right? That uh, we are all just products, not even final products of our conditioning. And also that there are people who have walked this path and who have become enlightened. So there's some inspiration in there. And because of this understanding, the suffering and its end, the possibility for its end, we learn to respond to life, not by saying, well, I'm just sick of it, I just chuck it away, there's no point being kind, you know, what's the point of doing anything to help others? No, the only wise response is loving kindness and compassion and a sense of letting things be, letting beings be free. You know, often we uh, hear this idea that love is what gives things freedom, or love is what enables us to let even people go. People that you've loved for a while, but maybe the relationship's not working out. Why are we clinging to that? You know, maybe that person, maybe you, will be happier in a different situation. Nothing's gone wrong, it's nobody's fault. Yeah. Or when a couple have been married for in my parents' case, more than 50 years. And they're very much in love, I would say, and loving towards each other, very respectful, and yet also attached. And when one of them dies, how easy will it be to let the other one go? We don't know. But love is what gives things freedom to go. 
It's related to letting go, the third noble truth. The truth of giving, giving away, giving up, relinquishing. Freeing, freeing all these afflictive emotions from our heart and freeing the places we grasp, freeing that craving itself. So loving kindness and compassion give. They give of themselves easily, freely, readily, without uh, any demand. And they begin with the attitude. But what I really want to get into today is how we can um, develop loving kindness as a cultivation of mind to lead us into the deep states of calm. And as we've already learned during this retreat so far, that the proximate cause for stillness is happiness, a special kind of happiness. It's not, unfortunately, the happiness of just pressing a button and getting into a deep state. That may feel good, but have you really um, cultivated the ethical quality of your mind? Real happiness has an ethical component. It's inherently virtuous and beautiful and ennobling for the heart. You know, if we didn't have to train the mind, if we could just automatically experience bliss, we might be just the same when we, end, when we exit that state, right? Because we haven't really learned how to live, how to relate, how to um, uh, generate kindness in life. It's not coming from a deep enough sense of wisdom. So metta has this wisdom inherent in it, and it also gives rise to a happiness that's really pure, that's really selfless, and again, doesn't expect anything. In other words, you're not even looking for the happiness to arise. So I love this practice because when we practice for ourselves with breath meditation or even metta for ourselves, sometimes we're not that bothered really about how we're going to feel. We're just like, okay, I've got to get it right, or um, maybe we get a bit obsessed about our practice and our progress. But with loving kindness, we think about someone else. And I remember the first time I really started developing loving kindness as a samadhi practice in Italy, actually, on a, on a retreat. Um, there was so much motivation because I guess I was more fault-finding to myself. I probably still am compared to a loved person. And the motivation wasn't quite so deep to practice wholesome states just for me. But when I was considering this metta practice as a service to somebody else, a giving to somebody else, and it was someone who'd sponsored that retreat, there was so much motivation that could really easily keep me connected to the image and the, um, the sense of that person, that the metta just really flourished. And I was kind of, yeah, almost floating for that retreat. And of course, that fed into my own loving kindness, and it also enabled me to overcome some trauma without even trying. I remember having a couple of insights into a trauma that had happened in my life before. And one of them was, I caught a glimpse of myself in a mirror. Nowadays, when I do that, I'm like, nah, nah. <laughs> Never mind, you know, don't look away from the mirror. But at that time, I really looked like a deva, like a whoa. There was this kind of aura of peace and and just deep, deep ease, you know. As the Buddha said, it makes you radiant, not just feature-wise, but the whole being becomes kind of radiant and light. And I realized there was this sense of protection around me, like a, I don't know what you could call it, some people might call it a big aura or something like this. But I had this insight that had I been in that state of loving kindness at the time, there's no way that person could have physically assaulted me. It would have been impossible. And the caveat here <laughs> is not to say that if anybody's ever abused in any way that it's something wrong with you, that you didn't have enough metta, this is not the point. It's the other person's bad karma, it's, the other, it's nothing to do with you, okay? But the impression that I had at that point was just the power of loving kindness to protect the mind, to protect oneself, and probably, to be honest, not even get into those situations. And that would be probably... Um, the outcome of loving kindness because we have so much loving kindness also to ourselves that we don't put ourselves in danger in any way or we see the signs earlier and we take the measures necessary to protect ourselves so it doesn't mean we just walk into any situation I'm so full of love you can do what you like to me this is not the point but it is a resource and it's a way of being um, protected from the difficulties in life 
You know, your mind is more resilient, it's softer, it's wider. And this is one of the benefits of developing samadhi, that the mind becomes great. The Buddha used the word mahagata, a mind gone to greatness. And there's a beautiful simile in the Anguttaras. I think it's in the Anguttara 3, it's called a lump of salt. Loma something, or loha something, I forget, or lona. Anyway, we'll try and get it in the reference list. Um, and in there it says that, you know, if you put a salt crystal into a small glass of water, that water is not possible to drink, it's completely undrinkable. Yeah? But if you put the same salt crystal, however big it is, into a huge lake, it just won't have any impact. You won't taste that salt. The water will be still as pure and sweet as ever before. Maybe even more nutritious. And in the same way, you know, if something difficult, like salty or rocky or sour, happens in our life and our mind is small, it has a huge impact. It really shakes the mind, you know. Our mind is brittle, so it cracks and falls apart. But if that same thing happens to a mind which is expanded, which is vast, which is boundless and also very soft, then it won't have very much impact at all. So this is one of the benefits of loving kindness as a cultivation. And as I said, it's, very, um, it's a very beautiful, pure happiness that you can really trust, you can really rely on, because it's going to bring benefit to you and all beings who come into contact with you. Another really lovely thing about um, metta practice and karuna is that they're both trainings in perception. We start to see the conditioned nature of perception. We start to see how, for example, as I said last night, if our mind is uh, kind of tired or stressed or um, <coughs> agitated, then we tend to view the world in quite an uncharitable way. We tend to view other people with irritation, with a sense of, like, it's just too much even to engage. You know, you're already up to here. And, you know, you just don't have that capacity to meet things kindly. But if you're in a really lovely mood, also, you see your past differently, right? You look at your life in general, and you just pick out all the mistakes you've made, all the things that went wrong, because you're tuning up to that same kind of frequency, if you like. You know, you're just connecting all the other times you felt miserable as well. And you're making a kind of perspective on your life, you know, also projected into the future. It's always going to be this way. This could go wrong, that could go wrong, it's bound to go wrong. It always went wrong before, you know. We use these words always and never, which are very delusionary. But if our mind is in a state of metta, even our enemy starts to look beautiful. They look like a little soft panda teddy bear. <laughs> You know, we start to see that they're not so bad, that maybe we could kind of call them up and have a cup of tea, talk things over. Yeah, not to mention the people we already love. We start to see all their beautiful sides. And we also look at our life in a much more positive way. So we are literally creating our world through the state of mind that we have. You know, we're perceiving it completely differently. And neither is correct. Neither is the reality as it is. It's conditioned by our perception at that time. But if perception is conditioned, then why don't we try to condition it in a way that leads to wholesome states? Because right now we're not seeing things as they are. We don't have that insight just yet. But we can develop states of mind that are uplifting, that are resourcing, that are deeply calming, cooling, beautifying for the mind and do start to overcome these hindrances to help us see things more clearly. So actually those states of metta are probably less fabricated, less distorted than the states of ill will, because the hindrances are less. And this is another important uh, facet of the practice of metta. It's not just a feeling. It actually has an ethical purpose, which is to overcome ill will. A few people have talked to me in the interviews about fear also, not only ill will. And fear is on the side of ill will. It's another kind of aversive reaction to something that's maybe a bit overwhelming or a bit um, uncertain, frightening, uh, unknown to us. And, you know, so many people suffer from, I mean, all of us have fear, but 
many people these days also suffer from anxiety, quite a lot of anxiety, and understandably so with the state of the climate emergency and you know, political situations throughout the world and the kind of stuff we're fed right through the media. It's really doomsday. And um, it's quite natural to have anxiety. Uh, I've noticed, actually, because I've been organising retreats for my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, in England for the last eight or nine years, huge organisational kind of feat, because we reach probably a thousand people every tour. So we have lots of talks, lots of retreats, and, you know, have to kind of get together all this volunteer support and... uh, uh, all the bookings and the ticketing and everything. And um, in the beginning, I, I, I remember when people started applying for these retreats, we asked them a few questions about their uh, state of health. And we've added more and more questions about mental health. But um, in the beginning, maybe 20% talked about anxiety and depression. And now it's 80%. So this is really a kind of endemic. Is that right, Endemic? It's not a pandemic, is it? (laughs) It's something that we face. And metta is a beautiful antidote to to anxiety and fear. It's the first time that the Buddha taught uh, loving kindness was actually to overcome fear. Because there were these monks who were very kind of bold and decided to tell the Buddha that they were going off to meditate in the forest in this really scary kind of eerie place. And they were going to sit there all night and and practice and hopefully get enlightened. So off they went with all the best intentions, but a little bit too much gung-ho, perhaps. And uh, they went to this forest and sat down under the trees and everything was okay for a while until, you know, it became dark and then the wind started to howl in a strange way. (laughs) (laughs) And they started to think, oh my goodness, what is this? It can't be just the wind, it must be some like non-human being who's come to kind of stir us up. But nope, they were going to sit there really strong. And, <laughs> and then the trees started to kind of sway and the leaves started to make funny noises and they started to um, get really scared and imagine all kinds of strange beings that had come to disturb them. And maybe it was true. So basically, after some time, they got so afraid that their hair... Well, they didn't have much hair, but the hairs on their body stood on end anyway. (laughs) (laughs) And they ran back to the Buddha. And they said, ah, we couldn't stay there. This place is haunted. There's all these invisible beings and people trying to, you know, disturb our meditation. And the Buddha said, well, you know, I did recommend that you didn't go there. You need to first practice loving kindness, then try again. So he gave them the practice of loving kindness. Uh, which probably included loving kindness to invisible beings as well. (laughs) And they went back and they actually managed to stay there and there were no more disturbances in that forest. And that might sound a little bit far-fetched, but actually in Myanmar, I stayed with a very wonderful meditation teacher, my preceptor, Sayadaw Upanyajota, and he was meditating in deep samadhi from the age of 15 or 16. These kind of monks have been ordained since they were five years old. There were nuns like that too, by the way, but just less because there are less opportunities. But uh, I have met quite incredible nuns in, in Burma too. These are countries which are Buddhist countries, and there's an opportunity. There's a lot of teachings available, but also opportunities to ordain at very young ages. And so um, he had all these psychic powers from a young age and used to tell his teacher who would be coming to the monastery that day and what they'd be wearing. And, you know, he'd be able to see things at a distance as well. And when I was in the monastery with him, he would talk about invisible beings quite often. And it was kind of normal. It was magical, but it was kind of normal and very um, in sync with the atmosphere somehow. It felt very... Um, rich with Dhamma, a very, very strong, beautiful atmosphere, as though there were a lot of good energies around. But sometimes there were energies that were disturbing, and he would then say, oh, it's uh, these beings that aren't yet entirely happy that we're here, so we have to send them metta, you know, because obviously to make that forest monastery, he had to kind of build some things and disturb some of the vegetation, and even, like, create a little lakes and little mountains out of a piece of land that was quite flat and uh, built me a cutie on top of one of the hills. 
which was just wonderful. I got a tiny bit of breeze in that cootie, but not very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and he was really in tune with those things. So he recommended to me that whenever I go to a new place, I ought to ask permission from any invisible beings that were there and just reassure them that I was there to cultivate my mind and that I would be sharing the blessings of my practice with them. And actually, I've forgotten to do that recently, I have to say. But it was something that stayed with me for quite a long time. And it's just a beautiful way to cultivate our mind. So it doesn't really matter what the object is. It's more the case that we're developing this beautiful sense of harmlessness and um, trust. And other beings can pick up on that. You know, you can notice when animals pick up on that. I think um, Clement, the dog, is really enjoying it here. <laughs> He's, like, literally going around, like, who's the next one that wants to help me? <laughs> because he knows it's a safe space, and this is the result of practicing lots of loving kindness. So loving kindness overcomes these hindrances, and it's particularly effective for ill will or aversion, even boredom, restlessness, which are all aspects of the same, and also fear and anxiety. And that can be helpful at the deeper stages of meditation, even if you're practicing mostly with the breath. There may come a point, there will come a point, if it hasn't already, when you start to move into mental territory that you're not so familiar with, and you start to get a glimpse of the power of the mind. You start to feel like there's this kind of almost overwhelming brightness and, and um, energy that could almost blow you away, right? And actually, it could. <laughs> so, but in a beautiful way. But sometimes fear arises, and there's a sutta which I mentioned to a couple of you uh, in the interviews called um, the Upakilesa Sutta. It's Majjhima Nikaya number 128. And the Buddha actually talks to three monks who are practicing the way that we are in that sutta. And they get to the stage where they start seeing visions and light in their mind. And they also have all kinds of responses that basically destroy the stillness. And the most common ones, which are included in the list, and there's a lot of them, uh, even things like a lack of energy, you know, just kind of losing your energy at that time, or excess energy, or kind of just drowsiness can still come up at that point. But the main ones are actually a sense of fear and excitement. And these are actually very similar. One may be slightly on the positive or on the craving side of things, like, oh, what's going to happen? The other one's a bit more like, oh, what's going to happen? But, you know, it's kind of the same. The heart might start beating fast. Some of you might suddenly hear your heartbeat, or you might feel that you're being kind of sucked into something. It's like, oh, I'm not ready for this. You know, the bliss is too strong. And the practice of metta, you know, in your daily life is going to be a helpful antidote to that, to allow you to get more and more familiar with um, beautiful, blissful states of mind that are soft and that are non-threatening in a sense, but also to overcome these tendencies towards uh, fear and uh, towards anxiety as well. So metta is very powerful in that way, leading to deep meditation, because often the most kind of sticky hindrance that we have is a sense of aversion, the fault-finding mind, as Ajahn Brahm calls it. So how do we practice metta practice for samadhi? And there are two different ways, roughly speaking. There's probably many, many more, and I'm sure many of you have discovered your own ways. But according to the text, there are two. And the way that it's described in the early Buddhist suttas is usually as a kind of spatial expansion. So this is where we get that lovely passage about um, abiding in loving kindness to all quarters and that loving kindness becoming abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide one quarter, two quarter, three quarter, four quarter, and above and below with a mind of loving kindness, is how it goes. So it just means we're expanding the field of metta outwards in an impartial but very boundless way. And this can be a kind of energetic expansion, 
this sometimes works to sort of feel that feeling of metta and then just imagine it spreading, you know. Imagine it maybe like light or like kind of softness or even like vibration spreading outwards. And it just spreads in every direction so far as it's unimpeded and including above and below. And the simile given there is like a trumpet that's blown from the top of a mountain and it just naturally, the sound radiates in all directions. You don't have to say, will it go this way, spread it that way. You know, it's heard everywhere, it's heard all around. And in this case, the actual individuals that you're spreading it to are less important than the directions. So it's much more impersonal than what's described in other texts. And um, I personally think this is, you know, very effective to generate a certain evenness of mind, a certain um, expansion very early on in the practice. But it can miss something out. And so what we find in the Visuddhimagga, which is a commentarial text, is uh, that goes into great detail about the practice of all kinds of, I think, 40 different methods of meditation that we referred to earlier in this retreat. But it also goes into detail about metta practice. And there we are choosing categories of beings and we're gradually building up the metta. So Ajahn Brown's simile, which is great, and I can't do better than this, is like you putting on, um, you're making a fire, and you want to start with the easy person first. So the easy person is like the kindling. So we take an object which is really easy to develop loving kindness towards, to get that fire going. And then after a while we put on like twigs, which are a little bit harder to take the flame. And then when that's going, we put on logs, if it's still going and the fire's getting stronger, which it should, then we can put on even big, wet, sappy logs, and even they will take the flame and start to burn. <laughs> There's a story <laughs> from my own life where um, I was living in Santee Forest Monastery in New South Wales, it's near Sydney, and uh, one of my teachers came there, he's called Sayadu Ujagara, and we're actually teaching a month-long retreat together next year in uh, Massachusetts, if anyone's up for a month. <laughs> but I think you have to have quite a lot of experience to come. Um, anyway, he was there, we invited him to teach, especially for the bikinis that were staying there at that time, and he's super keen to teach bikinis because he knows that we don't get a lot of opportunities for teachings, and also... Um, thinks that we're very sincere in our practice, which, to be honest, I mean, monastics generally are, but as a bhikkhuni especially, you really have to be uh, very committed because it's pretty hard to survive <laughs> So, due to the lack of support. So he came there to teach, and he was in this kind of uh, big kind of yurt, but it's very thin, there's no insulation, so inside all of these uh, huts were little fires, and his was kind of a cone shape, so I knew it was quite hard to get the fire going. And he said to me, you know, how do I make the fire in there? And I said, well, you know, you, you get some kindling, you put that on first, and then after a while you put the twigs, and then you put the, you know, the medium kind of logs, and then you put a couple of bigger ones on top. So the next day, he did all that, he came back into the meditation, and he said, uh, Oh, I, I did that, but the whole thing went up in smoke. <laughs> the whole room filled with smoke. And I said, uh, what do you mean you did that? He said, well, I put this and this and this. I said, well, all at once. He said, yes. <laughs> and I said, oh, you were meant to put it on like one at a time, not all together, right? So we don't try to put it on all together. And in a way, trying to spread it out, you know, in all directions straight away it can be like that. It can be like putting all those logs on at once and all you get is smoke. <laughs> you don't really get the loving kindness or you just get the soot. The fire burns and it just, it just, swamp, it just goes out, right? <laughs> so with this method, we're not doing that. We're getting the kindling actually lit, first of all, to quite a great degree um, until the metta's quite sustainable and we feel it as an emotion in the heart, it starts to arise, and then we go on to the next person, and the next, and the next. So to break that down a bit further, what we're doing here is uh, getting to the same place, you know, we're getting to that point where we can spread in all directions to all living beings, but we're making sure that no nook or cranny in the heart where ill will might fester 
thing, places we haven't seen, no places left unseen. So we really work through our, um, our aversion, our grudges, our resentments, and really free up the heart so we can genuinely, genuinely send it to all beings unconditionally. So that's obviously a big job, right? And we're going to have to keep working on that throughout our lives because people will keep on disturbing us as long as we're not wise. And, um, you know, the meta has to grow in response. So how do we actually do this? And uh, basically the first person that um, is referred to in the Visuddhimagga is to start with oneself. <laughs> And as everybody here, or many people here might know, that's not always the easy person <laughs> for many of us. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, I disagree with this idea that you can't love others without loving yourself. I think you can start anywhere, anywhere that's easy. You know, it's like inspiration. Do you have to be inspired by yourself or can you find inspiration externally? Of course you can. And that encourages you to find it in yourself, right? We see qualities in others that we have the potential to develop, otherwise we wouldn't notice them in others. We already have some of it, but it inspires us that this is possible. And sometimes we receive also um, how it feels to be loved, and that teaches us how to love ourselves. So we can start with ourselves if we wish. And I often do start with myself, at least um, the body, really relaxing the body, being kind to it, generating a beautiful attitude of friendliness. And then giving myself some goodwill, maybe remembering some of my qualities, things I've done that other people say have helped them, and feel good about my life. But as an actual meta object for going deeper, I usually take a lost person. So this is the second category. Um, but it's worth working with ourselves. You know, we need to remember our goodness. Remember people that see that in you if you can't see it in yourself. You know, how would your best friend look at you? How would someone you really trust or who is your teacher or who is your partner look at you? The good things, right? The good things, when they're in a good mood. <laughs> you know, what would people generally say about you? What would your colleagues say? How would you like to be remembered when you die? What do you think you'd be remembered for? You know, when I think of that, I think, yeah, I would be remembered for trying my best, you know? However far I've come on this path, I know I've been dedicated I know I've been as kind as I can, you know, given the conditions of my life. And yeah, isn't it? Wouldn't most of us be seen that way? I think so. So why don't we kind of rejoice in that now? <laughs> you know, in Perth, some clever people, I think it was in Perth, but I've heard that they've done this in other places too. People have started do doing their own funerals while they're still alive, just to hear the um, <laughs> eulogy. Just to hear what people say about them. Because <laughs> they feel like it's such a shame that everybody says really lovely things after they've died. You know, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> and also, I must say, the, the other reason is to see who comes. <laughs> so if you don't come, you're not my friend anymore. <laughs> Some people do that, yeah, to see who's actually going to show up. But that's a bit, yeah. That's not so uh, skillful, perhaps. <laughs> but that's just a bit of fun. But, you know, why don't we consider these things now and consider the way we'd really like to live and then look at the ways we're actually accomplishing that and bring up that loving kindness. So we start to be more our own ally than our own enemy, our own kind of worst critic, because this is really the cause of a whole lot of misery. So then the locked person, we start with them, and as I said um, very briefly in another uh, guided meditation, it's better to choose someone you're not too close to and too involved with, especially if there's a complicated history, um, but somebody you have a very pure sort of love towards. And even sometimes with people we definitely have a very pure love towards, still, if we have a lot of busyness with that person, you might start thinking, oh yeah, I've got to call them, I've got to do this and this and this. <laughs> so just choose someone that's easy and that just brings a smile to your heart whenever you reflect on them. And again, you know, one of the difficulties about the loved person, or it's not a difficulty, but each category shows you something about where you're blocked. It shows you how the love can become less than conditional. <coughs> Yeah, 
And with a loved person, that can um, show up as attachment or as a sense of um, hopes for the future, expectations, etc. Or, as I said, with this particular person in America, worry that she would somehow fail her daughter, you know. So it's okay, we can work with that and recognise that, but keep on developing it anyway. And sometimes we might have to change the loved person to become someone else, someone more simple. And then the neutral person means a person we don't have strong feelings of like or dislike towards. And it's interesting when we move to this category because actually most people in this world are neutral to us. We don't know most people. We don't like or dislike most people. We uh, have very few people, relatively, that we're very invested in. And so, precisely because of that, we start to see that the mind doesn't stay with the object so easily. And this can show us that, again, self-interest that we have in love, when there isn't much of an interest in this person's well-being because they don't really have much of an effect on our life, the feelings of love are harder to bring up. And that shows us, doesn't it, that so much of the time it's a sort of self-referential love. So again, not to condemn it, but just to notice this. And on the other side, it can also increase the love. It can be easier because you don't know too much about a person. You can give them the benefit of the doubt. It can be this general sense of may you be well like all beings, you know. Why should I single anyone out? So in a way, it can become very pure at this stage as well. But it's really the last one, and this is the wet, sappy log with the disliked person. <laughs> and this should not be your sworn enemy or somebody who's inflicted a great deal of um, trauma, you know, who you've suffered a lot with. It should just be someone who you maybe don't like very much, they irritate you, or you can see a version arising and you'd rather it didn't, you know. It might be someone you have to face often, and it's affecting your, um, your happiness at work, for example. And... Um, yeah, you're just not really seeing the whole person. You're just starting to connect with those triggers that stimulate ill will. So we use this dislike person to really um, bring up more loving kindness. And in a way, although it's difficult, this is where loving kindness reaches its aim. Because the purpose, again, of loving kindness is not just to feel good, or it's to feel good, but due to removing the hindrances, due to actually purifying the mind. So it's at this point that loving kindness reaches its kind of summit, if you like. And if you've been kindling that fire really well and the fire is going strong, you might find that when the disliked person comes to mind, sometimes in my meditation, they just come in when the mind is ready. I don't have to actually intentionally practice. When that happens, you they're just is no impact. If the mind is really ready, the love just continues to pour. It just continues. Because there's so much resourcefulness, there's so much love, there's so much perspective that ill will simply cannot arise. You just see this person as another being, doing their best in samsara, getting it wrong, just like we do, saying unskillful things, you know, behaving in harmful ways. They don't know better. And we can have this loving kindness to them as well. So, this is really beautiful, and um, when it reaches this point, then loving kindness starts to become boundless and unconditional, and we can spread it in every direction. And from there, you know, the mind can actually absorb into deep meditation. It can do that earlier, too, even with a single person. But, um, you know, the idea of all beings is very similar to the idea of one. It's a oneness, like the idea of all is a sort of... Um, it's a, it's a single object, if you like, so the mind comes together, it unifies at that time. And the aim, I have to tell this story, even though we're running out of time, but the aim of loving kindness is told in a story, um, I guess Ajahn Ram tells it again, but sorry, it's recycled, but that's what you get. We are recycled versions of Ajahn Ram. <laughs> but I, I'm changing it a little bit, because it's about seven nuns, and these seven nuns, <laughs> they live on top of a mountain, but actually they went there to meditate and get enlightened, and they found this amazing place, you know, like a cave, very rare to find, and they thought they can be safe there. But unfortunately, um, it was the exact same place that some bandits had buried some gold or some treasures, and um, 
Is that my thing making a noise? I hope not. Um, they buried some treasures in that mountain. So one day these bandits went up to the mountain. They said, right, we're just going to kill all of you because, <laughs> because there's some treasures buried here. And the senior nun said, well, that wouldn't be a very wise thing to do, you know, because you'd make a lot of bad karma. They were not really, really bothered about that. But they came up with a deal and they said, OK, well, we'll just kill one, you know, as a kind of um, warning, you know, that we mean business and that you'd better get out of here because this is our cave. And uh, choose the person you'd like, like us to take as a sacrifice to save the other six. So the senior nun had to think about this. And uh, basically, the other six nuns were something like her best friend, her sister, possibly her teacher was there, her enemy, a sick nun, and a useless nun. <laughs> a useless nun, couldn't get it together. Yeah, you know, couldn't even keep her robes on properly, and the speaker thing kept bashing around. <laughs> <laughs> totally useless. And so she had to make a decision. So you're not allowed to say um, the answer, okay, because this is what people usually do, but who do you think they chose? Like, really, think about it, you know, because there is a difference between somebody's sister or best friend or teacher and their enemy or useless person or sick person they were going to die anyway the sick person they were old they were you know maybe only had a few more days to live and I don't know if they were even enlightened but if they were who cares right they could be sacrificed what do you think so what's the answer who did she choose oh no one dare say so <laughs> that's the usual answer that's the usual answer but unfortunately or fortunately this nun had developed so much loving kindness in every direction working with the neutral person and the <laughs> loved person and the disliked person that she just could not choose it was impossible to choose she couldn't even sacrifice herself because the love for herself was the same as the love for the enemy as was the love for her teacher even the same as that there's no pedestals anymore. Every human being was worth the same, was loved the same. It wasn't even a matter of worth, right? And so that was the answer she gave to those bandits. And they were so impressed. You know, this was at the risk of her own life, right? They were so impressed by that that they said, OK, OK, we leave you alone. You carry on meditating. We'll go somewhere else. So that was the story. And that is the aim. So um, I haven't really got on to how we do it yet, so I do have 10 more minutes, so I'll try to fit that in. But um, basically, when we practice love and kindness um, as a cultivation of the mind, it's really helpful, I find, to start with um, some discursive thought, which is directed towards loving kindness, which is a kind of um, uh, expression of loving kindness. So thoughts like, may you be happy, May you be well, may you be safe, may you be at peace. I usually make it rhyme actually, because I like that, it's soothing. So I say something like, may you be happy, may you be free, may you be healed, may you be at peace. I like that. But you can do any, and you don't have to have four, you can even just have one. Bhante Sajato uses one, may I be happy. That's it. And that's his main meditation object since decades. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be happy. And someone <laughs> came to him once and said, I really don't like this word may. <laughs> and, and someone else came and they said, I really don't like the word happy. And someone else came and said, I really don't like this word I. So Vantasajata said, well, is the word be okay? <laughs> But the main point there was it doesn't really matter what these words are, but it is important that they resonate for you. So I also, I don't mind, may I be happy, may you be happy, but I like content. Um, you can experiment for yourself. They're basically wishes for mental happiness, physical well-being, feeling of safety perhaps. So it could be may you be healthy, whatever. But the main thing about this is that we have to say it from the heart and really give it our full attention, as if it's a beautiful gift coming from ourself to another. 
So we say the words clearly, calmly and rhythmically in a way that soothes the heart and we pause in between each phrase and we just keep our kindful awareness present to any feelings that arise in response, not looking for any feelings but just keeping present, just listening and this kind of allows the mind to just follow in that direction. It's like you're giving your mind a sign, a hint if you like, and you're letting the emotion develop in accord. So it's a beautiful balance of method, placing that phrase, saying it again, putting your attention on it, and intuition, just letting the mind do its thing. So it's a balance. And as the emotion of loving kindness starts to grow, you can find that you need the words less and less. You might be able to create really long gaps, or you might just drop down to the actual emotion. So, for example, instead of may I be happy, just happy, and then peace, ease. But you keep the image of this person, if it's a loved person, in mind. Yeah, you keep a sense of this being your sending meta too, so that it's very clear that that is your object. But the real loving kindness itself is the emotion. However, the other reason it's really effective is because whenever you plant a, a thought of loving kindness, you're overcoming any thoughts of ill will, any thoughts that are just random, distracting, kind of proliferating thoughts. You know, you're basically learning right thought and developing right intention as well. So these are really powerful conditionings of the mind, and you'll find that the more you incline that way, the more thoughts of loving kindness become natural to you when you most need them in life. The Buddha says in um, this uh, Dweda Vitaka Sutta, it's Majjama number 19, two kinds of thought, that he was aware that whenever he had a thought of ill will, it was impossible that he'd have a thought of loving kindness. But the same was, the other way around was true. If there's a thought of love, you cannot have a thought of ill will. So you're purifying your mind. And furthermore, he said that whatever we frequently ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind. So your mind just keeps on moving in that direction more and more naturally to the point that it does become an abiding place for the mind. It actually becomes our character. You know, Our whole disposition to life is one of kindness and compassion and goodwill. And we don't even ask what's the point of that. You know, There is no point in being any other way. <laughs> it's just spontaneous, it's natural. You feel like you're coming closer to what it means to be a true human being, you know, what real humanity is. So um, this is how we build it up. And I kind of think of it at this point like planting a seed, you know, the, the um, phrase is like a seed and the heart is like fertile soil, if you like. And your kindfulness, the awareness that you... Um, you give to that in between each phrase is like the sun, the warmth, and also the rain, just kind of watering that little seed. So you're not trying to kind of make that seed grow. You can't stretch that seed to, you know, make the plant shoot up more quickly. You're just giving it fertile conditions. You plant it in fertile soil, means you do it softly, gently, reverentially, in a sense. Like you do this as something beautiful, really understanding the, the beauty of this. And then you shine on that gorgeous kindfulness and allow these things to grow in their own time. So just to recap, because as usual, there's a lot to say on the topic of loving kindness. It's a pretty big one. Uh, <laughs> and compassion as well. So you can change your phrases for compassion. If you find that there's a lot of suffering or um, distress in the mind, it's not really relevant, it's not appropriate to say, may I be happy, because that's like wishing it away or wishing something to be there that isn't. So instead you could say, may I be kind to myself, may I embrace this suffering, may I be free from suffering, um, whatever makes sense to you. May I learn how to hold this gently. Uh, what kind of attention is needed to soothe whatever is coming up for you? That's not really a, a question to ask yourself. But, I mean, it's not a phrase, but it could be a kind of question that you ask. You know, what is needed here? What's needed to soothe this? And you focus on the freedom from suffering. That's why compassion becomes a beautiful, um, happy abiding as well. 
So the process of loving kindness is one of making good mental kama, supplanting thoughts of ill will for thoughts of loving kindness, um, really strengthening right attitudes, right dispositions, right ways of relating, or let's say wise ways of relating to life, to the world, to our mind, to our breath. The breath can become an object of loving kindness as well. And um, holding any difficult emotions that arise or unwanted emotions in that light of love. You know, shame might arise. We can hold it in a space of healing, in a space of kindness, in a space of acceptance. Yeah? We're widening the, the lake. We're creating a big lake, a big mind that is able to contain so much, you know, so much more than that little brittle mind that's full of the hindrances. So this is um, an expansive state of mind and this is resourcing and gives us more resilience in life. Our mind becomes soft. You know, so if something kind of hits our mind, it just bounces off. It doesn't kind of shatter us and make us fall apart. And even more than this, because loving kindness can be taken into the deep meditation where the hindrances are completely overcome, we have the opportunity to see right to the bottom of that lake. The mind becomes like a huge lake, but also a very still lake. So we can now look through the water and see right through to the bottom what's going on in there. And in the same way, we can start to use that empowered mind that's come to stillness through loving kindness as a means to develop insight into the way things really are. So that means to direct it towards impermanence, towards suffering which now will not impact your mind it won't make you suffer you'll just be able to see it for what it is and also non-self and the buddha also said well of course it's a training in perception so we see the conditioned nature of the mind but we even start to understand that those states themselves are conditioned even states of jhana states of loving kindness states of compassion are still conditioned they arise due to causes very beautiful causes but they're not the end goal. And the only real end goal is seeing the conditioned nature of all of this and transcending that and experiencing Nibbana, the end of all conditions. So loving kindness is a powerful method to take you right to that goal, you know, through developing deep meditation, through transforming your life. <laughs> because if it's really worth its name, then that deep meditation should um, change you, it should change your behaviour, the way you relate to the world and to other people, uh, bring more forgiveness, more of a sense of gratitude, um, less fault finding for yourself and other people. And eventually, you know, there'll be so much um, clarity of mind, you'll be able to uh, overcome ill will completely and transcend those states and realize the ultimate goal of full enlightenment. So this is uh, the scope of loving kindness. And uh, some people do use it as their main vehicle, their main practice. And I would definitely recommend you use it at least some of the time, maybe in the mornings, in the evenings, before you sleep, perhaps at the beginning of your meditation. But don't just see it as a second-hand meditation. I actually think it's probably one of the best, the very best, if not the best. You can't really pitch these things, but, you know, it is as powerful as Anapana, and it can be combined as well. So make much of loving kindness, because it's going to have incredibly transformative effects on your life, and it's certainly going to be a very happy path from where you are right now all the way to full liberation. So that is the talk for today. <laughs>